It's now my pleasure to uh, present Tor Wenesland, who serves as the United Nations Special Coordinator for the Middle East peace process. After a long diplomatic beginning at the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Prior to this, he was Norway's special envoy to the Middle East uh, peace process and chaired the ad hoc liaison committee. He served as Norway's representative to the Palestine Authority and as ambassador to Egypt and Libya. Wenesland was also instrumental in establishing transboundary water agreements for the Euphrates and Jordan River basis. Mr. Wenesland, the floor is yours. And, and we hope you can raise our morale the same way that the uh, British Foreign Minister did. Uh, we would love to hear that. Thank you. Well, it's a hard act to follow. But uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's an honor. I... I'm very impressed by the work that is going on in your institute, the way you foster a broad-based dialogue on terrorism and anti-terrorism activity. And I think we should remind ourselves about the sneaky feeling of numbness that would always hit someone who is exposed to terrorism. Thank you. I'm saying this based on my own experience. And I must say that there is very little that is hitting me straight in the stomach, literally, as when we are faced with a blatant terrorist attack uh, in this area, and it hits me every time. So what can we do about it? You know very well that the UN system is a very soft component that can be and should be applied in a, in a situation where we have unsettled conflicts, blatantly organized terrorist activity supported regionally, organized on the ground here, whether in Gaza or at the West Bank, and lavishly funded from outside and from inside. So, as a representative of UN here, I would just remind that the Secretary General is holding a very, very tight line on terrorism. He is emphasizing that terrorism preys on local and national vulnerabilities and the instability of political economics and security systems, adding that poverty, inequalities, and social ex exclusion give terrorism fuel. I think it's a very important perspective put forward by the Secretary General. But let me add that general unsettled situations on the ground doesn't provide any excuse for terror attacks at all. And I, I want to make it very clear that I'm not going to put forward analysis of how to deal with the political environment here and say that if this or that is happening, terror won't appear. Because as James said, it's a twisted logic by people that would use whatever is available as an explanation and excuse for terrible acts of violence. Last year, when I was here, I talked quite a lot about Gaza and the Gaza dynamics. I will do more on the West Bank this time. But let me start with Gaza, because it's still with us, and it's still fragile, whatever is being done. Let's first have a look at what is being done in Gaza. 
What is being done that has changed dynamic inside Gaza? First of all, are a set of measures that has been implemented by the government of Israel. The issue about allowing some 20,000 people um, to work in Israel, coming out of Gaza after security checks, is bringing significant money into the Strip and to the families of those who have the permits. And it's creating a dynamic whereby the total amount of money carried into Gaza by the workers allowed to come out and work in Israel is the same amount as the total budget of UNVA in Gaza on an annual basis. It's significant. It is 300 million shekel a month. Why am I saying this? Because there is one way of pushing back on those who control the strip. It is by some measures carefully adapted and designed that can give people a chance inside that they wouldn't otherwise have. I have been arguing very clearly for a further reopening of Gaza for many reasons. First of all, I mean, since I'm coming from Oslo, and since I started my work uh, just before we signed Oslo 2 on this file, um, when Oslo was signed, there were 980,000 people living in Gaza. Now there are 2.2. And Gaza hasn't been becoming bigger. Half of the people living there is below 16. So the, the situation we have there is actually that more than a million of kids is being kept hostile or right, they're being uh, imprisoned and uh, kept uh, with reduced possible life expectancy because of some very cynical way of controlling the strip. So when I'm, when I'm arguing the case for opening more, we have a strong case. It is the actual ability of Israel to control that gradual opening that can settle Gaza back to something that is more normal, and it's needed to be done. More trade, more export, more on the economic side, but keep control. Because the most stupid thing I know is if you recommend measures that somehow up the risk, as if that risk is not existing. Uh, and I'm not going to go that line uh, as UN at all. But still we need money into the system. I mean, come on. After the war in 21, in May, the UN has provided and facilitated um, a capital inflow in support of electricity production and outreach to poor family that amounts to 550 million US dollars from when we started up until now. If that hadn't happened, we wouldn't have had the ch same chance to turn on the light in Gaza, which is smart, and to provide support for needy families. And I can tell you, we haven't had one single incidence of those receiving that money that shouldn't have had it. Because we have a system of doing that sort of monitoring so money is not falling down in the wrong pockets. But if we take, in the Gaza of today, away all these measures, then I can assure you one thing. There is a plan A very clear by those who are running the strip to escalate the situation very fast in order to create further disturbances. Let's have no illusion whatsoever. 
So the undermining of the support system we have as UN in Gaza, as the international community in Gaza, is creating instability and will be used as an excuse to destabilize the situation further. West Bank. I have never seen the West Bank as it is at the moment, ever. I have been in and out here for almost 30 years, and I haven't seen it worse. I haven't seen the fabric of society at the West Bank falling apart the way it's doing at the moment. And there is a very negative dynamics inside the whole Palestinian community. And when it comes to the relationship between Palestinians living at the West Bank and their own authority. It's a massive thing to reset this, and it won't happen fast. But the very fact that the trust in the relationship in a society is as fragile as it is at the West Bank today is a massive security problem. The politics is very dangerous at the West Bank now. If you then add a couple of other spices into it, a couple of other components into it, we end up where we are today. I am not fully able to understand the very significant uptick in the availability of very sophisticated weapons that are around all over the West Bank, not in the hands of the Palestinian security forces, but of organized groups, either connected to Hamas or Islamic Jihad or others, or more ragtag things as we had in Nablus, carrying weapons and sophisticated equipment that quite few of the Palestinian security forces have available themselves. So there has been a systematic inflow of these things at the West Bank. It has been targeted to specific groups. They have been trained and they are well funded. And they are organized in such a way to create massive disturbances along two lines. One is to further undermine the PEA and the Palestinian security system on the ground. Another one is blatant and proactive attack on Israel. Either as terrorist attacks in the streets uh, of Israel, as we have seen in growing and terribly growing numbers, not only in, in Israel's cities, but also against Israeli civilians at the West Bank. Um, for me, I mean, if, we, if a serious security coordination cannot be established, and it needs to be, this problem will continue. I know there is serious attempts to have that coordination, but there, it doesn't really fully work. And we see that in the streets of the West Bank, and we see it in the perpetual <coughs> conflict zones that are now all over the place, even in places we consider to be safe and sound and quiet, like Jericho. Uh, it's affecting life of civilians. I know people are very scared in Israel. I can assure you, people are very scared at the West Bank as well. Because the whole trajectory of, of uh, this dynamic. The, um, what is the way to deal with it? I mean, I agree with James 
that it takes a different degree of political leadership and courage than we have on the Palestinian side at the moment. It takes more. And it takes more in the sense that you have to draw some lines of principles whereby when things are going off the rack, you have to stand up and push back on it from the political system, also on the Palestinian side. That does not happen. It is a very difficult thing uh, for me as UN to see this happening, but it's a fact. What I do see is a growing focus on the Israeli side relating to a particular trend of violence that has been ramped up significantly and very dangerously by Israeli settlers in areas at the West Bank. And I must say that I really welcome the very clear statement made by the IDF chief of staff, the head of the ISA, and the Israeli police chief on that thing. And the fact that these people are brought to justice in a proper way. They are well organized, and I can assure you, they are very dangerous. But there is a willingness to address it. And it's clear and it's stated, and I welcome that to happen. But I, 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 would, I would say the following. I mean, unless this is becoming a part of a real drive to stabilize the West Bank, we will end up in a continuous gogmire, as we have seen uh, in many places. And nobody is spared. I mean, I had a very high-level American civil servant in my office the other day who were run after by a group of armed settlers at the visits he had at the West Bank organized by the American embassy uh, on the ground. And she was clearly shaken and disturbed by what was happening. I also welcome the statement done by the Israeli cabinet on the 9th of July, where it was said that the cabinet would, quote, prevent collapse of the Palestinian Authority, unquote. If that is a plan, and I want to kind of take that as a given and as a said. There need to be more in the bag than security measures. Security measures alone won't make it. So that bag will have to contain elements of economy and financing. What the UN will do in this current situation is that we will try to move our resources so we can make a contribution in areas of high conflict at the West Bank. It means in the cities, in area A, it means around the camps uh, where we have a Palestinian flash flashpoint, and it means providing services that otherwise would not be available. We are in the midst of doing that because we believe that the UN system can do something on ground at the West Bank, as we have done in Gaza uh, over a long period of time, but in particular and upgraded so after 21 uh, escalation. So again, let me conclude by saying the following. The contacts the UN has with your security system, with your politicians, and with your experts is a very important part of conducting work in a proper way for the UN. I thank you for inviting me here. <laughs>